right? So the, the, the sense of whether they would be able to make it under this system um, is very different, I think, than what most uh, middle class and working class families think about, which is I probably couldn't retire without this. It's also true that it's gonna be very different if you work in a very physical industry, if you're working in construction, or even sales where you're on your feet a lot um, at 60, 65, 70, starts to feel diff different than if your job is you know, to sit on a TV set and commentate, which is a little easier to do, uh, or to sit in the Senate. Um, so uh, I think that, that, that it is a different issue, and you're right to get back to that basic uh, issue. We'll just open it up for questions and comments now, since we seem to be. Yes, sir. Is there any third party that has looked over this and that's politically neutral, if there is such a thing? Like, it, was it GAO or whatever? Yeah, so two parts. So the question is sort of independent analysts validating this. There's several different ways that independent analysts have validated. In some cases, they've come to the exact same conclusions, like the tax hike on the middle class. The Tax Policy Center was not only a group that Mitt Romney referred to as credible third-party analysts during the primary. Last week, he cited them as being uh, one of the most credible independent analysts uh, in the game. This is who? The, the Tax Policy Center, which is run by one of President Bush's economic, the first President <coughs> Bush's economic advisors runs it, and one of W's economic, President W. Bush's economic advisors co-wrote the report with a guy who worked for Bob Rubin, who's not exactly on the left wing of the Democratic Party. So this is a very down the middle group. The numbers we take for this uh, are taken from uh, Congressional Research Services and GAO reports about predictions of the cost of health. So this is not us sort of cooking the books by saying there's gonna be this dramatic cost. Um, it, now that's true, you can draw this map the other way and say, okay, here's the value of the voucher stays constant, the, the price of healthcare goes up, so we just need to bring the cost curve down. It's the same math. Uh, the issue is that, again, back to this question of who is the burden on to bring that cost down? The, you know, is it a matter of forcing the Senate to try to reach an agreement on something to deal with this, or the individual who's gonna go out and sort of be at the limits of the private market for that? So GAO and uh, Congressional Research Services, we do have uh, footnotes in the report, uh, the last two or three pages uh, are that. Yeah. I guess specifically what I'm asking is, is there one of these groups that is uh, validated by both sides that has come to the same conclusions that this has? Uh, yes. So uh, generally speaking, I think uh, I mentioned with the tax numbers and then here, I think you can look at Congressional Research Services or GAO reports on the cost of health care. Now, they, I don't know if they've run the numbers specifically on this, but it's, if you connect this to uh, regular inflation and you conclude that, the, um, that health care is going to rise higher than the price of inflation, um, the math isn't that complicated, right? So the issue is what assumptions? So uh, I think there are plenty of independent analysts who, who agree that that gap exists and that the voucher would not grow with that amount. Um, now doing the, the math based on the year of birth is, is pretty basic uh, arithmetic. Yes, So uh, I want to be clear about methodology on this, um, which is we move from things we can know with certainty, macro cuts, to looking at what we can know. So we know under his plan that uh, I talked about in the higher education setting, the $820 more, I believe, $820 less in Pell Grants, um, and then $1,700 impact on the opportunity tax credit. Um, now looking at the federal spending numbers, if you look at the chart on page seven, uh, we have a few numbers that we can, uh, and, and I, again, I want to be clear, this is where, the, where Mitt Romney has not been very specific. So taking that 40% number, 
you can look at impacts in Florida uh, of nearly 25.4 billion in federal aid in 2010. Uh, that would be in the category potentially of the 40 percent. You put a human number on that on page eight, the Head Start numbers, you're talking about potentially 7,600 fewer slots uh, for children in the Head Start program, um, as well as uh, significant job losses. We talked about women in the economy. Uh, education is still one of the fields that uh, women are more likely to be employed than men. So when a lot of the cuts, when you talk about uh, potentially staying or increasing defense spending while cutting education spending, there are certainly implications for women uh, in the economy for that as well. Special ed, I think I mentioned 139,000 uh, children potentially at risk. So what we look at with this, what we can and can't know, we cannot know from the positions he's taken so far exactly how, uh, whether he'll single out certain programs or not. And until that uh, specificity comes, we have generally based those conclusions at a, uh, based on across the board numbers of the cuts he would have to make in order to reach uh, the budget uh, that he's talking about. Um, so we're talking about issues that would affect Head Start, uh, would affect Title I uh, education, would affect uh, higher education. It's also true for job training in community college, people who may not be going to a four-year university, uh, a lot of the, the skills training programs. Um, now, you know, we were in Tallahassee yesterday, so there were a lot of folks who were very interested in this fact that, you know, including some conservatives who were saying, wait a second, you're telling me he's going to run on this plan and then I'm going to have to go out and explain why we have to raise taxes in Florida to cover this huge gap uh, of funding that's coming from the federal government. Medicaid would be similar where they're talking about going to a block grant program with a block grant that is considerably smaller than what Florida now receives, which again means you're either looking at cuts to some of the most vulnerable people in the state or somehow having to, to, to close that gap uh, by raising local or state taxes. Um, so we've, you know, we've tried to be as transparent about the methodology as possible. Education is certainly one of those areas where, um, you know, if you, uh, there's been a lot of joking about Big Bird uh, in the last week. You know, I think the point of that pushback was this is not a big idea. This is not something that is a, an idea at the scale of the economy. Uh, and of the budget decisions that need to be made, even if you feel like it's a good idea to cut that funding. Education is a big piece, um, and what the basic bargain has been with the states is that while education has traditionally been a local and state matter, uh, there are certain things we've decided as a country in particular, uh, like special needs and Head Start that are an important investment, um, and the federal government's gonna bring some dollars with that. To cut that back is something that's gonna have real impacts on communities.